Hi, I'm Mark Morial, and I'm proud to serve as President and CEO of the National Urban League, and welcome to Banking with Purpose as a part of the 2020 Milken Global Conference. Let me offer some opening remarks before we get to a dynamic, exciting, and uh, really well-prepared uh, panel discussion today. Uh, black people or African-Americans make up 13.4% of the U.S. Po population, but nearly half of all COVID-19 deaths in the U.S. are black people. Compounded by wealth disparities, the twin health and economic shocks we faced in 2020 are having a devastating effect on minority low-income households. Access to capital remains one of the most important factors limiting the ability of many minority-owned business enterprises to not only withstand the current crisis, but to increase scale and drive post-COVID economic recovery for that community and for the nation at large. Minority depository institutions or bank and community development financial institutions are federally designated financial institutions with well-evidenced track records of targeting the underserved populations in America. This section will explore how MDIs, CDFIs, and other strategies in partnership with regulators and national banks can be effective conduits for access to capital. So I'm proud this, this afternoon to give brief introductions of those who will be part of the discussion today. First, we have Brian Brooks. Brian is the Acting Comptroller of the Currency of the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency. Second, we have Emmanuel Friedman, CEO and Co-Chief Investment Officer, EJF Capital. Then we're joined by Kenneth Kelly, President and CEO of First Independence Bank, as well as the lead for the National Bankers Association, the Association of Black Banks in America, and Dan Latendra. Dan is a Senior Vice President, CDFI Lending and Investment Executive at Bank of America. And then there's Jelena McWilliams, the Chairwoman of the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. Thank you for joining me. We look forward to a great discussion. And Kenneth, I'm gonna to go to you first. Uh, sure, you've got vast experience as a CEO of an MDI and chairman of the NBA. Uh, I want you to contextualize the challenges that minority bankers face today. And can you share what your peer lenders are experiencing in their efforts to scale up their operations in our communities across the nation. So thank you for being with us. Thank you, Mark. And thanks for your leadership at the National Urban League, which really has been uh, a wealth of fresh air across this country, what you do every day. When you think about the question, let me first of all say thank you to the Milken Institute for having this as an important topic in the midst of COVID-19 and to my fellow, fellow panelists who I've served with in so many different capacities across this country as regulators and also as industry partners with Bank of America. But Mark, your question is, is spot on. There is a contextual structure that is very different when you look at African-American banks and African-American communities. And we're seeing that play out in two instances in the midst of COVID-19. One is a life issue, which is a health issue. And two is a livelihood issue, which is an economic issue. The challenges we face as institutions is really just having the bandwidth to be able to meet the need of the communities that we serve. To put it in context, the African-American banking structure is about $5 billion in assets. The total banking structure in this company, country, which is over uh, 5,500 banks, is about $21 trillion. So to put it in scale on a proportional basis, it is a really, really small, finite um, amount. But the reality is, from the studies of the Federal Reserve, from studies of the FDIC, demonstrates that Minority institutions have a greater impact in the communities we serve. And I'll close by this statistic, which is most African-Americans, 70 percent, do not even have a banking branch in their neighborhood. So there's an access problem and then there's also a truly access problem. Hey, thank you for that. Before I go to our next panelist, PPP, did it work for black banks? Did it work for the black community? Did it work for black businesses? Kenneth? 
Oh, I'm sorry. I, I thought you were asking another panelist that question. No, I was uh, asking Mark, you. Yeah, sorry about that. So, Mark, I think you, our organization, along with the NAACP, the congressional um, churches, there were several organizations that did a lot of polling that demonstrated that we had a gap in reaching the deep parts of, in particular, the minority community. Some of that was lack of information and knowing that it was out there and available. Some of that is just in the basic structure of many of the businesses and how they operate their businesses. And so the reality is it did not meet, from my perspective, proportionality on a relative basis across the country. The reality though it is, is that minority institutions did deploy about $10 billion into the minority communities overall. So there was some impact. I would say it was certainly not proportional and we, what we found in our banks was really being challenged with trying to scale that up and move forward. So there's a need for more FinTech and technology in there. I think you've, many of us have heard Robert Smith talk about that topic. So we do need to do a better job in that particular area, Mark. Thank you. Emmanuel, I'm gonna to come to you. And uh, first of all, uh, we share the great Georgetown University Law Center uh, as a place we both earned our JD. But when you hear this discussion about the need to scale uh, MDIs and African-American banks, what does that say? What does that mean? What advice do you have? Because you're experiencing so, Peter, put up, I have a slide that tries to put it in a little bit of context. If you could okay. put up the slide, that'd be Great. very helpful. And just as Ken said, it's actually a lot worse. Uh, if, if you're assuming 13% of the population is African-American and also big portions of not just that population, other population are in the areas substantially below the median income. You can see that not just MDIs, because there's MDIs, there's minority institutions that are depository institutions, there's credit unions that are depository institutions, and we also have loan funds, CDFIs, and they're about $500 billion. But if you really look at the shadow banking, that's completely understated. And the total bank assets, these are Federal Reserve Board numbers as of June 30th, you see that you're talking about half of 1% is, is active in this area. That doesn't mean some of the banks aren't active, but this is the people who are completely committed. So what you have is simply no assets, no loan, massive loan ability the way you have in other areas. So it's a completely massive disproportionate system that's not just happened in the last four years, but eight years, 12 years, 16 years, 20 years. This is a systemic problem that's been going on for a long time. And that means that it's so extreme that you know people need to think about big solutions to try to solve this issue across the board. As Ken said, it's also underbanked, so or not banked. So uh, that also at least means tech could play a role, as they did in PPP. But you know we'll we'll have to see. But the main point is, it's like the tip of an iceberg, the actual loans that are available to this community. And, and when you look at this, and if you wanna, you talked about big ideas, scalable ideas, where would you start? At two places, and it's very discouraging because you go to Congress, you talk to them about it, over and over again, the Federal Reserve Board talks a great game, but the net result is zero. Uh, when you really get down to it, I haven't seen any 13E programs for this community. So it, the two things are needed, massive amounts of real capital. That means capital that is equity-like, that makes these institutions stronger and stronger, the same way we have many small banks that were $100 million, they're now $40 billion in 10, 15 years. Okay, they had access to capital and they grew. And those, those numbers are mind-boggling. Brian, let me go 
ask you, uh, you talked about branch banking and the fact that many black and brown and communities of color do not have a branch bank. 70% of them do not near their homes. And uh, certainly we see and hear today that many major banks are moving away from branches, moving to online platforms. Will that exacerbate the problem you just identified? So, so Mark, what I was saying is the, it doesn't have to be a problem, but it will be a problem if we don't align incentives. So what I mean by that is that historically, um, you know, for the last 50 years, the way that the Community Reinvestment Act drew bank investment into communities was based on where the banks gathered their deposits. And best proxy for that was where their branches were located. So what we've tried to do in our most recent update to the CRA is to tell banks they need to be making lending and investment activities in places where they gather the majority of their deposits, regardless of the way they do that is online or at a bank branch, right? And that's designed to make sure that they're investing even in areas where, where people are no longer being served by branches. What I would say though is, is, is this, 20 years ago when the Grameen Bank won the Nobel Prize as the only financial institution ever to win the Nobel Peace Prize, the reason they won the prize was because of their insight that making small loans to poor women in places like Bangladesh and parts of Africa would allow them to buy Android phones from which they could run businesses and engage in financial services. And I think if you ask young people today whether they lived in a poor neighborhood or a richer neighborhood, they would all say that their lives revolve around their phones, not around brick and mortar um, stores, let alone, let alone bank branches. And so if we can get banks to focus on the fact that there's profitable business to be done in neighborhoods that are poorer, I think we can bring that back. And I think our CRA reform is part of that incentive. But if we fail to do that, uh, then we're going to have a real problem. Branches are not the delivery mechanism of the future pretty clearly. Um, smartphones are. And banks need to figure that out and find ways of serving underserved communities in that channel. So Dan, let's go to you. Uh, you recently partnered, Bank of America did with First, First Independence in a commitment to scale the reach of MDIs. And this may be a model for collaboration. Uh, I want you to describe this relationship. And then Kenneth, I'm gonna come to you uh, to give your thoughts about it. Dan? Thank you, Mark, appreciate it. And thank you to the Milken Institute for including me in the, in the conversation. And Mark, for you for your work and advocacy on this topic. Um, you know, as Mark, you and I have discussed in the past, when supporting minority small businesses and minority communities, uh, mainstream banking institutions like Bank of America have a responsibility and an obligation to support both on a direct basis, the mortgages we make, the small businesses we make, the branches, etc. And there's an opportunity to do so on an indirect basis through CDFIs, through MDIs and similar institutions. I mean, make no mistake, working with MDIs and CDFIs can never be, should never be, will never be a replacement for the obligation to work directly in minority communities, low-income communities, but it is a truly wonderful supplement. I've had the honor, the privilege of managing a business focused exclusively on CDFIs and MDIs for 24 years now. I've come to understand they are the most creative, nimble, mission-driven institutions uh, that are out there. Um, we've been supporting MDIs in the form of deposits for years and years. Um, and deposits of you, uh, MDIs and CDFIs have used that capital to end up funding lots of small businesses and, and customers inside their communities. But it's really become clear that not all forms of capital are the same. Deposits, um, while helpful, right now are extremely plentiful. Lots of institutions, lots of organizations, lots of individuals are interested in putting no risk deposits into minority depository institutions and into CDFIs. The constraint right now is not deposits. The constraint right now is the equity capital that would mm -hmm. underpin the potential for growth. Mm -hmm. I'll say deposits are decent and capital is critical right now. And so we came to the conclusion after talking to a number of institutions and understanding how awash with liquidity we are in the system right now, but how poor we are from a capital perspective. And we shifted and made a commitment to start 
with $50 million of equity investing in minority depository institutions, um, both uh, African-American banks and Latino mission-driven Latino banks across the country. And Kenneth Bank was one of the first that we ended up providing um, equity capital to. I cannot um, emphasize strongly enough the need for both equity capital right now in this system and from the CDFI loan fund perspective, the need for long-term, extremely low-cost capital to allow them to do the work that they do. So, Dan, uh, against that backdrop, Kenneth, uh, I think it would be helpful to help those who are listening understand the distinction between equity capital and deposits and what the equity capital would give a bank like First Independence an opportunity to do that it can't do today. Certainly, thanks, Mark, for the question. And let me say thanks to Dan publicly and his organization. If he recalls, about a year ago in October, we were having these conversations with roughly the top eight banks at the National Bankers Association uh, annual conference. And so it's glad to, I'm glad to see all of this start to come to fruition. The point I want to make is that sometimes we see the corn when it arrives in the grocery store, but we never see the farmer plant the corn. And so my point is that a lot of this takes a lot of momentum and a lot of work to get to the fruit that is required. To your question, Mark, uh, when you think about banking, think about the banks in terms of deposits and equity. The way that I would separate it is the equity is of what allows you to expand and grow. So for every dollar of, of equity that, that I have, basically I can lend against that um, to the point of nine times. And so what it does is, is allow us to be more meaningful to our communities from an equity perspective. You look at the data that the Milken Institute has put together, it shows that there are disparities across not just minority banks, but within minority banks. The average MDI African-American is about nine-ish percent of equity to it, it's the, um, of equity capital. When you see Hispanic and in particular Asian banks being much higher. So Dan is exactly right. When we think about it from the National Bankers Association perspective, we have it tiered in really three areas. Equity capital is first, and I think Manny will certainly agree with this. Revenue generation is second, meaning loans and fee, non, uh, fee income opportunities for our banks. And then third is deposits. So we are glad to see that there's a shift in the sector. And you heard the comments from Chairwoman McWilliams and also Brian Brooks, Brooks that I think supplement the, the need for equity into these institutions. And uh, Bank of America is the first really bank that even finally did something like this. But what we really need is something much, much bigger, and it's frustrating. We need to get Ken's bank to go from 150 million to a billion to 40 billion, the same way UMCA went, the same way Banner went, so that, in fact, you know, Bank of America is complaining that he's taking business away from them. That's what we really need. And we just had Congress, again, you know, kick the can down the road. They had an opportunity to put up $13 billion for 1% uh, perpetual preferred, which would have counted as capital, but no, they decided that was too much. Uh, so it wasn't done, but, but what everyone needs in these sectors is access to massive amounts of capital. And we're talking about billions. With 13 billion, you're eventually going to create $130 billion of loans. That's, see, that's see, Manny, a mind-boggling number. What you're so, doing, Manny, is you're, make, you're making the point that I always make, and that is people need to understand the multiplier effect of these types of investments are broad and significant. There are st more studies, uh, and we don't need to even kill another tree to do another study, that demonstrates the impact on the gross domestic product of the United States if you can narrow some of these economic gaps. And this is, this is where uh, I, I think we need uh, we, we have to disavow ourselves of the zero-sum game mentality. The notion that if black banks grow, they invariably have taken something from somebody else. And that is, that is stifling uh, to the need to do things like this. I say all the time 
that the spending power of African American, uh, the African American community in the United States is about 1.5 trillion. That is almost equivalent to the gross domestic product of the Russian Federation. The Russian Federation is not much bigger in their GDP than the entire spending power of black America. If you took the black community, the Latinx community, and the Asian community together, you've got 4.5 to 5 trillion out of an economy that's about an 18, 17, 18, 19, 20, 20 trillion dollar economy. And the, the, the understanding of some of the basic economics of the country uh, is, is what troubles me. For example, when the PPP was designed uh, by, uh, at the Treasury Department, I wonder who looked at any data. Did they know that, for example, half of all businesses in America, regardless of the color or the ethnicity of the owner, has less than five employees? Uh, did they understand that 90% of black businesses had one employee and no more? And so in designing it, they came up with this, this, this level that 500 employees constituted a small business. They didn't even use the SBA's longstanding size guidelines, which are in the statutes in the CFR. Uh, the point I'm making is, is that we are deal policy makers, uh, if I can be so you know, bodacious historically, have been financially illiterate about the economy and an understanding. This We're talking about a private sector initiative here that could be supported by private dollars and government to strengthen. Where are you going to get, Manny, a nine times plus up on an investment? Right. Where can you get a nine times plus up on an investment? I can't no find way. a so I mean, I think, yeah, go ahead. Ken. I was just going to say, you're exactly right. That fundamental of, of banking and how it works is not fully understood, but it is one of the things that has made this country great, which is being able to take in deposit, pop deposits, do the fractional lending in the communities that you serve. And as you termed it, I would say plus up. But the reality is the chairwoman said it best. There is an ecosystem. And what is great about what Bank of America just did is demonstrating oh, yeah. there can be a symbiotic relationship that Bank of America doesn't have to do it at the expense of First Independence or any of the other MBIs and vice versa, that if we do this together, I think we'll see a multiplier effect for the economies that we're trying to serve. So let me say in closing on this comment that we are grateful that Bank of America is a shareholder in our institution along with several other MBIs. But the reality is what Manny has been talking about for years is there needs to be something that is a strategic shift in the way that we think about things. So just put it on the, on the platter, Mark. There is still $130 billion left over from the PPP allocation that has not been deployed. Um, wow. the, the question is, can some of that be utilized in a way that could really plus up these institutions, utilize the actual economy that you just talked about in expanding these institutions? And I would say, uh, we need to put that on the table, and it's something that needs to be discussed. And Manny has been a drum major on this topic, and so have we. Chair McWilliams, let me go back to you and ask you to share your thoughts and some of the work you all have been doing around CRA reform, which is an important uh, element in what we've been discussing. No, absolutely. But if, if I can just touch upon the fund we're setting up at the FDIC, I know it's a, it's a small drop in a, in a big bucket, and I know that the need especially for the communities of color and low and moderate income communities is tremendous. Um, and frankly, I've, I've had an opportunity to even live in these communities. And, and I can tell you, we probably cannot do enough, no matter what you do. So I think when people think about it from a policy making perspective, doing more rather than less is probably going to yield so much more in the long run, uh, uh, working with a multiplier. But the fund we're setting up at the FDIC, the, the, the point is exactly that. 
to get the infusion of capital into the fund, then that will, over time, work with compounded interest and investments in these uh, MDI and CDFI institutions, frankly, that are on the front line with a number of these communities that have been historically struggling with uh, being able to reach economic prosperity like the rest. And so, um, acting controller Brooks touched upon this. CRA is one vehicle how to get there. And uh, when former controller Auding was in the office, we engaged in a number of discussions and negotiations on the CRA, um, the three agencies, including the Federal Reserve, to come up with a framework that frankly uh, would be better than the framework we have had in place for almost 40 years that has not kept to date with the innovation in the industry and with the innovation how consumers use, uh, to Brian uh, Brooks's point, uh, how consumers use telephones and other mobile devices to do the business of banking and sometimes never step into a branch, right? Uh, which is something that from the FDIC's perspective, we're struggling, you know, usually you would walk into a branch and you would see, you know, guaranteed by the deposits insured by the FDIC. And now, you know, when consumers don't walk into a branch, how do we make sure that they understand that we stand behind that guarantee? So we looked at the CRA from that perspective, and, and I would like to commend uh, um, former controller um, Auding and, and acting controller Brooks for continuing uh, to engage in this topic. Uh, we have we have worked on the rule together. Uh, we did not finalize our rule because uh, most of our small banks, uh, which, which are the banks we primarily regulate, were engaged with PPP program. Um, and we know that there were many, many technical issues with the program. Uh, and, and I'm sure Kenneth and others here have experienced that as well. Uh, but they, but they, we also didn't want them to uh, kind of a shift their focus from modifying loans, reaching out to their communities, especially to low and moderate income communities and small businesses serving those communities. So we have shelved our rulemaking for now and are hoping to engage as soon as the economy stabilizes a little bit, because I think it's a crucial step in this effort to make sure that large banks and banks that are not minority deposit institutions understand and engage with the way that, that their communities are banking. Which then brings me to my next point that I think it's important to discuss the use of technology. And quite often in Washington among the regulatory circles, you know, the fintech and, um, you know, just, just using technology companies to, to uh, team up with banks has been kind of viewed with suspicion because as regulators, we're naturally risk averse. But there is a tremendous amount of technological development that would enable banks and companies that partner with them to serve and expand the communities that they that they can serve now. And so, you know, Brian mentioned this uh, earlier, but when you think about underwriting loans, uh, you know, we talk about home ownership being a pathway to creating wealth in the United States, right? And so in the past, from a regulatory perspective, you know, you had to look at the credit scoring, the 20% down payment, you had to make sure they had a stable job. And for a lot of uh, communities of color, when there's a lot of economic volatility, depending on how the economic winds shift and these communities get impacted, you know, I would say the winds shift and they get whiplashed quite often. Um, it's important for us to recognize the power of technology and innovation to enable folks in the low and moderate income community to enter the banking stream, to become banked. And again, to the point of an ecosystem, if my neighbor does well and their lawn is not dried up and, and there is no garbage in their front yard, you know what? My property value goes up. So I am I have an incentive to make sure that my street is clean, that my neighbor's lawns look good. And so I think we need to recognize that the same analogy applies in the banking sector. And this is not a, you know, I win, you lose game. Uh, I would say there's no Attila the Hun here. This is frankly, um, I think we need to be more of a mother Teresa than Attila the Hun and understand that if my neighbor does well, so will I. And I think we're making strides, but to Manny's point, not quickly enough. And I, I'm certainly committed to making sure that during my tenure at the FDIC, we're able to produce even more, and that this is one of the forefronts of the agenda for us uh, during my tenure. Well, look, I want to you need, you need to run for office, that's number one. Number <laughs> two is, I'm being serious. Number two is Congress doesn't get it. When they need to, in an emergency, they'll do something. They'll put $100 billion in AIG. They'll put $100 billion in the city corp. They can't put $20 billion, $30, $40 billion into, into these areas through financial institutions that can leverage 10 to 1. They, they did these other things in 10 seconds. And, and, well, Manny, and so you know, I don't understand it. They don't view it as a crisis. They, it, it's a short-term problem. And 
they are hoping it'll go away, but there is no real effort to put billions of dollars, and that's what we're really talking about. We we it has to come as a government program or a government guarantee or partial guarantee or a, a government uh, you know facility because it needs to be huge. It needs to be billions and billions. The same way in '09. Things got solved by putting up billions of dollars in one fell swoop. In the same way, this problem can be solved, but it will take a number of years, but it's going to take billions of dollars multiplied mm -hmm. by 10, as Ken said. Manny, I think you, you're making such an important point. And, you know, it's my hope uh, with uh, Milken's leadership continued thought leadership on this is, is that we are going to be able to move more aggressively on this going forward. Right Mrs. now, Williams didn't commit to run for office. Oh, <laughs> oh I don't know about that. Uh, we can talk offline. Manny, I still Manny, have just, with that. <laughs> Manny, Manny just drafted you and I'll, I'll give you the playbook on it. And, uh, and also uh, the good, the bad and the ugly of running for office. <laughs> but, but I think, you know, going forward, what I see and we all need to see is the economic devastation of 2020. Uh, the the, the self-induced coma of COVID uh, has devastated African-American businesses. It's had a broad impact uh, on the economy. What, what I noted was that Congress was very, very quick uh, to move to do something uh, and the Federal Reserve to create a credit facility for airlines and the hospitality industry. Quick. Now, my point of view was, I'm not opposed to that, but why only them? Why not uh, the people we're talking about here? Why not address it more broadly? And there's gonna have to be a greater awareness of, uh, you talked about the Mother Teresa, uh, if you will, mindset, the fact that this is something that is good for the entire nation, something good for the economy, and that as long as we have a zero-sum game mindset, uh, we're going to be in a circular, circular issue. But what the George Floyd moment, the George Floyd moment is not simply about George Floyd. It is about George Floyd. It is about justice for George Floyd. It is about policing. But it's about the broader economic disparities and social disparities that exist. Uh, in, in the nation. And I'm excited about this conversation because we have regulators, we have private sector players who who, who have the power and the ability uh, to move the needle on this. Uh, but we're going to need more players to the, at the table. Bank of America is one. We need the others. We need the regional banks. We need the shadow banks. Uh, and as you say, Manny, we need uh, the national government. We need the but federal they're, government. But they're worse than that. You, it wasn't. They put up billions this time around for commercial paper, for asset-backed securities, for mortgage facilities, everything for under everything you can think of, except for this type of program. And you're not talking about ten billion. You're talking about hundreds of billions. You're talking about trillions, trillions. No, and you so are. I understand it. Everybody talks this wonderful game, but nothing ever. It, but you don't get the commitment of real size that would make a difference hey. over time. So, I mean, what? And what, Kelly what, needs to get to a billion dollars because there's facilities out there to do it. No, I think you're absolutely right. And, Manny, when you talk to policymakers, what's their response? I mean, there are some policymakers who understand it, Maxine Waters, Senator Warner, Senator Booker, but, you know, it all gets bogged down. It's so hard to get things done. And the only things get, get done in Congress is when they sense an emergency. I hate to say it, if you didn't have Black Lives Matter, this would never even, not even a little piece would be on the table. You're right on that. Let me let me let me change the conversation in this fashion because I think uh, this is an important question. So let's talk about messages that need to be sent. 
And uh, you know, Dan, I, I'm I'm gonna gonna go to you first. Mm -hmm. So, what's the message to the larger banking industry at this moment? So one 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 sense is, hey, we've been doing things. What's the message needed to do more? Okay, um, a couple of messages in, in one. One, as you've heard before, which supporting entirely. Um, we don't view and no mainstream large financial institution should view CDFIs or MDIs as direct competitors or in threats of our business. Um, what we found with CDFIs, it actually helps our business and supports communities. So one, uh, every large financial institution, in addition to the responsibilities of doing what they need to do on a direct basis, also need to partner and engage with CDFIs. Two, the way in which you can do it, first and foremost, we're financial institutions. We lead often with capital. It's what CDFIs and MDIs need right now. And not all capital is the same. Right now, what we need is equity capital. And for, in the CDFI industry, it's philanthropic capital and low cost, long term debt for the institutions. Beyond that, capital, you need to be looking at building capacity for these institutions staff capacities, systems capacity, and build connections. That is, MDIs can refer business to us when they're working with clients that are outside the, the, the loan size that they wish to, and we will, and increasingly are, pulling in MDI institutions to participate in some of the credit facilities that we are doing. It's capital, like capacity, and it's connections. And every single financial institution has to understand that in addition to what you're doing on a direct basis, there are no better partners. There's no better opportunity to extend on an indirect basis than what you can do with CDFIs and MDIs. It's good business. No other way of saying it. So Brian and Yellen, and, and I'm not trying to get you in, in, in any trouble here, but I want you to, you know, the regulators are creatures of Congress. They're created by statute. Uh, they uh, they have a degree of independence. What message as regulators would you give to the policymakers in America? If, as we we are discussing here, this is a critical issue that needs to be addressed. What message? Who wants to go first, Brian? Brian, I'll be the well, gentleman. Uh, uh <laughs> <laughs> um, right. Well, look, I, I'm, I'm happy to jump in. I mean, li listen, the fact of the matter is, is that African-American MDIs in the national banking system have declined every year for the last 10 years. We're now down to only five left in the ecosystem. So we're never going to serve the needs of the African-American community or of minority communities generally if we look only to MDIs. There aren't enough of them left. So to Manny's point, they need to be radically recapitalized and built up for them to play the role that they can play in the future. At the moment, the way I'm thinking about it is there's certain things that really can only be done by MDIs, and we need to focus on letting them do that work. And here I'm talking about building trust in communities that have been scammed with financial scams for far too long. You know, one of the talking points I often use on this is there's a shocking number of people in the United States still paying 7% on their mortgages at a time when interest rates are less than three. And many of those people are minorities who aren't refinancing their, their home loans because they've been scammed so many times, they'd rather stay with the high interest rate devil they know than get a better deal. This is where MDIs play a critical role that can't be replicated by the big banks. They have the trust of their communities. And big banks would be well advised to partner with MDIs in areas where that trust is in short supply. I think if they start by building on that, the sky's the limit in terms of how big they can grow. But let's not think they're the only people who need to help because there aren't enough of them, right? We need big banks leaning in and doing their part too. Uh, Chair McWilliams. Sure, and I'll I'll add to Brian's uh, wise points. Um, you know, as as a as a matter of of the fact, we are uh, creatures of Congress. You know, Congress gave us authorities and powers. 
but I find it that it is our duty to talk about this and bring to the attention of Congress some of the structural issues. And when Congress gives you gives you a regulatory agency certain powers, you have some discre discretion there. And you know, you always try to use that discretion judiciously because you don't want to upset the people who are about eight blocks up here from, from the window. Uh, but I'll tell you this, I think we need to be bold in our execution and we need to be thinking, I mentioned it again and, and I sound like a broken record, we need to be thinking outside of the box and when we see we can fix some of the structural issues undermining uh, these communities through our regulatory framework. CRA is one of them, help to MDIs, assistance to CDFIs, etc. That all we can put in place some of those things. Where we don't have enough authority, I think it's our obligation to go to Congress and tell them some of the things that would be helpful and, and, and to be changed. And I will tell you, for me, it's, it's a personal mission. I, I came to the United States on my 18th birthday with $500 to my name. And if I, as an immigrant woman with no other support in the United States, could, through education and, and hard work and, and a lot of sweat equity, rise to the point of being an FDIC chairman, I refuse to believe that we have communities that have been born in the United States that have generationally not been able to succeed in the traditional sense of what success in America means. So from a regulatory perspective, I think it's our duty and obligation to go to Congress and highlight the plight of these communities and the effort that can be done to help MDIs and CDFIs serve those communities while at the same time removing structural barriers on the one, on the one hand through our regulation and on the other hand and thinking creatively about how we can allow banks to utilize technology so that you know some of the alternative data can be considered in the underwriting process so that the traditional black box criteria for uh, issuing credit to these communities uh, is changed where we take more things in, into account uh, as, as, uh, as uh, uh, acting controller Brooks mentioned to the REACH project. So I think there is a lot we can do and it's important that we are a voice for these communities and it is important to be actually our voice for MDIs and CDFIs and certainly I'm committed to doing that during my tenure here. And so Kent, thank you so much. Kenneth, I want to go to you as we begin sure. to close. Uh, you work diligently with a number of us and Manny rep, uh, referred to this on a measure which would have injected capital which would have been a, 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 a statutory initiative. Mark Warner, Cord Booker, Maxine, right. you're I mean, many of us were involved in trying to put that together, right? Uh, do you foresee a new chance in January to do something like that? Mark, I think we just have to beat the drum on this and not let it kind of fall by the wayside. Manny is exactly right. When you look at big things that have happened in this country, it is because it's had the government support or undergirding it in a way to make sure it was going to be successful. And so I think we have to, we, all of us, have to be the drum majors on this and continue to beat the drum because the Congress is elected by the people and we represent the people. And so we have to identify the need to ensure that this does happen, Mark. Um, I will tell you though, what is really interesting, I think we really have to talk about is all of the data shows that whether it's income inequality, network inequality, all of those things are built around the banking system. We live in a capitalistic society. And what I think we have to really do is continue to articulate why it is important that the least of these in our communities have access to education, have access to broadband, have access to healthcare, because those things help build up our financial system in the communities that we serve. You've heard many of the panelists on here talk about the components of being successful Chairwoman McWilliams and her story. That's every American story, their desire to be able to educate their family, feed their family, and when their family gets ill, have the financial resources to take care of them. So the MBIs stand in the stead to help with that. And we're so grateful to you and the Milken Institute to help bring this topic to the table and hopefully become a drum major to see this to its fruition. Well, we want to thank you. I mean, Go ahead, Manny. Chairman McWilliams' hands are tied. Brooke, Mr. Brooks' hands are tied. They don't have the power. All the power is in three places. Treasury, Congress, and the Federal Reserve Board. If they wanted to, they wanted to. They have $145 billion of 13E money. They could put $1.4 trillion on a 13E program if they really wanted to. And instead of talking about it and put it in these communities, through people like Ken Kelly. 
Oh, Manny, you are There's really no desire to do it, to be honest. You are an evangelist, and I appreciate your I'm candor, not an frank, frankness, and passion. But I say that with great respect because to have a private sector voice who understands the investor community, who understands this issue and understands the fundamentals that it requires a, a governmental thrust. It requires bold and imaginative steps, but that even those bold steps are small in comparison to the big. All of the things that the Federal Reserve has done, the Treasury's done, and the Congress has done over the last uh, 12 years with respect to the economy, whether it was during the Great Recession or whether it's been during the COVID recession. Whatever it's been, they've been bold. And why is it, why is it that this small element of the economy where you could see so much benefit uh, has not, and, and that is why I think the Black Lives Matter movement has resonated with so many Americans because they understand how deep and challenging this issue is. So what I want to do today is, uh, before we close, is offer this as a takeaway. What I hear all of us saying is, it's time for bold action. It's time for a break from the past. It's the time to look at some of the things that we've discussed and how they can be scaled much larger. And, and number two, that so much can be done for minority banking institutions, CDFIs, uh, with, uh, with, 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 with not a lot of money. With, with, with significant money, but not with a lot of money that's going to so-called break the bank. So I want to thank Aaron uh, and Milken and everyone who's listened today uh, for this conversation of banking with purpose and a real discussion on the role that the private sector can play to address income inequality and wealth inequality in America, which to me is the nation's most pressing uh, challenge. So thank you very much for joining today. I look forward to the continuation of this discussion and certainly want to encourage all the panelists to continue to fight, to continue to, continue to work and continue to be purposeful. So thank you very much. Uh, it's been great to be able to be part of this discussion today. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you, thank you for your leadership.